Section 3 of Library of World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernst Schnell. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 3. The Shadows on the Wall by Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman, 1852-1930 Henry had words with Edward in the study the night before Edward died, said Caroline Glynn. She was elderly, tall, and harshly thin, with a hard colorlessness of face. She spoke not with acrimony, but with grave severity. Rebecca Ann Glynn, younger, stouter, and rosy of face, between her crinkling puffs of gray hair, gasped by way of assent. She sat in a white flounce of black silk in the corner of the sofa, and rolled terrified eyes from her sister Caroline to her sister Mrs. Stephen Brigham, who had been Emma Glynn, the one beauty of the family. She was beautiful still, with a large, splendid, full-blown beauty. She filled a great rocking-chair with her superb bulk of femininity, and swayed gently back and forth, her black silks whispering and her black frills fluttering. Even the shock of death, for her brother Edward lay dead in the house, could not disturb her outward serenity of demeanor. She was grieved over the loss of her brother. He had been the youngest, and she had been fond of him, but never had Emma Brigham lost sight of her own importance amidst the waters of tribulation. She was always awake to the consciousness of her own stability in the midst of vicissitudes and the splendor of her permanent bearing. But even the expression of masterly placidity changed before her sister Caroline's announcement and her sister Rebecca Ann's gasp of terror and distress in response. I think Henry might have controlled his temper when poor Edward was so near his end, said she with an asperity which disturbed slightly the roseate curves of her beautiful mouth. Of course he did not know, said Rebecca Ann in a faint tone strangely out of keeping with her appearance. One involuntarily looked again to be sure that such a feeble pipe came from that full swelling chest. Of course he did not know it, said Caroline quickly. She turned on her sister with a strange sharp look of suspicion. How could he have known it, said she. Then she shrank as if from the other's possible answer. Of course you and I both know he could not, said she conclusively, but her pale face was paler than it had been before. Rebecca gasped again. The married sister, Mrs. Emma Brigham, was now sitting up straight in her chair. She ceased rocking and was eyeing them both intently, with a sudden accentuation of family likeness in her face. Given one common intensity of emotion and similar lines showed forth, and the three sisters of one race were evident. "'What do you mean?' said she impartially to them both. Then she, too, seemed to shrink before the possible answer. She even laughed an evasive sort of laugh. I guess you don't mean anything, said she, but her face wore still the expression of shrinking horror. Nobody means anything, said Caroline firmly. She rose and crossed the room toward the door with grim decisiveness. Where are you going? asked Mrs. Brigham. I have something to see to, replied Caroline, and the others at once knew by her tone that she had some solemn and sad duty to perform in the chamber of death. Oh, said Mrs. Brigham. After the door had closed behind Caroline, she turned to Rebecca. Did Henry have many words with him? she asked. They were talking very loud, replied Rebecca evasively, yet with an answering gleam of ready response to the other's curiosity in the quick lift of her soft blue eyes. Mrs. Brigham looked at her. She had not resumed rocking. She still sat up straight with a slight knitting of intensity on her fair forehead between the pretty rippling curves of her auburn hair. "'Did you hear anything?' she asked in a low voice, with a glance toward the door. "'I was just across the hall in the south parlor, and that door was open to this door ajar,' replied Rebecca with a slight flush. "'Then you must have.' "'I couldn't help it. Everything? Most of it. What was it? The old story.' I suppose Henry was mad, as he always was, because Edward was living on here for nothing, when he had wasted all the money father left him. Rebecca nodded with a fearful glance at the door. 
When Emma spoke again, her voice was still more hushed. I know how he felt, said she. He had always been so prudent himself, and worked hard at his profession. And there Edward had never done anything but spend, and it must have looked to him as if Edward was living at his expense, but he wasn't. No, he wasn't. It was the way father left the property, that all the children should have a home here, and he left money enough to buy the food and all if we had all come home. Yes, and Edward had a right here according to the terms of father's will, and Henry ought to have remembered it. Yes, he ought. Did he say hard things? Pretty hard from what I heard. What? I heard him tell Edward that he had no business here at all, and he thought he had better go away. What did Edward say? That he would stay here as long as he lived, and afterwards too, if he was a mind to, and he would like to see Henry get him out, and then... What? Then he laughed. What did Henry say? I didn't hear him say anything, but... But what? I saw him when he came out of this room. He looked mad. You've seen him when he looks so. Emma nodded. The expression of horror on her face had deepened. Do you remember that time he killed the cat because she had scratched him? Yes, don't. Then Caroline re-entered the room. She went up to the stove in which a wood fire was burning. It was a cold, gloomy day of fall and she warmed her hands, which were reddened from recent washing in cold water. Mrs. Brigham looked at her and hesitated. She glanced at the door, which was still ajar, as it did not easily shut, being still swollen with the damp weather of the summer. She rose and pushed it together with a sharp thud which jarred the house. Rebecca started painfully with a half-exclamation. Caroline looked at her disapprovingly. "'It is time you controlled your nerves, Rebecca,' said she. I can't help it, replied Rebecca with almost a wail. I am nervous. There is enough to make me so, the Lord knows. What do you mean by that? asked Caroline with her old air of sharp suspicion, and something between challenge and dread of its being met. Rebecca shrank. Nothing, said she. Then I wouldn't keep speaking in such a fashion. Emma, returning from the closed door, said imperiously that it ought to be fixed, it shut so hard. It will shrink enough after we've had a fire a few days, replied Caroline. If anything is done to it, it will be too small. There will be a crack at the sill. I think Henry ought to be ashamed of himself for talking as he did to Edward, said Mrs. Brigham abruptly, but in an almost inaudible voice. Hush, said Caroline, with a glance of actual fear at the closed door. Nobody can hear with the door shut. He must have heard it shut and... Well, I can say what I want to before he comes down, and I'm not afraid of him. I don't know who is afraid of him. What reason is there for anybody to be afraid of Henry? demanded Caroline. Mrs. Brigham trembled before her sister's look. Rebecca gasped again. There isn't any reason, of course. Why should there be? I wouldn't speak so, then. Somebody might overhear you and think it was queer. Miranda Joy is in the south parlor sewing, you know. I thought she went upstairs to stitch on the machine. She did, but she has come down again. Well, she can't hear. I say again, I think Henry ought to be ashamed of himself. I shouldn't think he'd ever get over it, having words with poor Edward the very night before he died. Edward was in a sight better disposition than Henry, with all his faults. I always thought a great deal of poor Edward myself. Mrs. Brigham passed a large fluff of handkerchief across her eyes. Rebecca sobbed outright. Rebecca, said Caroline admonishingly, keeping her mouth stiff and swallowing determinately. I never heard him speak a cross word unless he spoke cross to Henry that last night. I don't know, but he did from what Rebecca overheard, said Emma. Not so much cross as sort of soft and sweet and aggravating, sniffled Rebecca. He never raised his voice, said Caroline, but he had his way. He had a right to in this case. Yes, he did. He had as much right here as Henry, sobbed Rebecca, and now he's gone, and he will never be in this home that poor father left him and the rest of us again. What do you really think ailed Edward? asked Emma in hardly more than a whisper. She did not look at her sister. Caroline sat down in a nearby armchair and clutched the arms convulsively until her thin knuckles whitened. I told you, said she. Rebecca held her handkerchief over her mouth and looked at them above it with terrified, streaming eyes.
I know you said that he had terrible pains in his stomach and had spasms, but what do you think made him have them? Henry called it gastric trouble. Henry called it gastric trouble. You know, Edward has always had dyspepsia. Mrs. Brigham hesitated a moment. Was there any talk of an examination, said she? Then Caroline turned on her fiercely. No, said she in a terrible voice. No. The three sisters' souls seemed to meet on one common ground of terrified understanding through their eyes. The old-fashioned latch of the door was heard to rattle, and a push from without made the door shake ineffectually. It's Henry, Rebecca sighed, rather than whispered. Mrs. Brigham settled herself after a noiseless rush across the floor into her rocking chair again, and was swaying back and forth with her head comfortably leaning back when the door at last yielded and Henry Glynn entered. He cast a covertly sharp, comprehensive glance at Mrs. Brigham with her elaborate calm, at Rebecca quietly huddled in the corner of the sofa with her handkerchief to her face and only one small reddened ear as attentive as a dog's uncovered, and revealing her alertness for his presence, at Caroline sitting with her strained composure in her armchair by the stove. She met his eyes quite firmly with a look of inscrutable fear and defiance of the fear and of him. Henry Glynn looked more like this sister than the others. Both had the same hard delicacy of form and feature, both were tall and almost emaciated, both had a sparse growth of grey blond hair far back from high intellectual foreheads, both had an almost noble aquilinity of feature. They confronted each other with the pitiless immovability of two statues in whose marble lineaments emotions were fixed for all eternity. Then Henry Glynn smiled, and the smile transformed his face. He looked suddenly years younger, and an almost boyish recklessness and irresolution appeared in his face. He flung himself into a chair with a gesture which was bewildering from its incongruity with his general appearance. He leaned his head back, flung one leg over the other, and looked laughingly at Mrs. Brigham. "'I declare, Emma, you grow younger every year,' he said. She flushed a little, and her placid mouth widened at the corners. She was susceptible to praise. "'Our thoughts today ought to belong to the one of us who will never grow older,' said Caroline in a hard voice. Henry looked at her, still smiling. "'Of course, we none of us forget that,' said he in a deep, gentle voice. "'But we have to speak to the living, Caroline, and I have not seen Emma for a long time. The living are as dear as the dead.' Not to me, said Caroline. She rose and went abruptly out of the room again. Rebecca also rose and hurried after her, sobbing loudly. Henry looked slowly after them. Caroline is completely unstrung, said he. Mrs. Brigham rocked. A confidence in him inspired by his manner was stealing over her. Out of that confidence she spoke quite easily and naturally. His death was very sudden, said she. Henry's eyelids quivered slightly, but his gaze was unswerving. Yes, said he, it was very sudden. He was sick only a few hours. What did you call it? Gastric. You did not think of an examination? There was no need. I am perfectly certain as to the cause of his death. Suddenly Mrs. Brigham felt a creep as of some live horror over her very soul. Her flesh prickled with cold before an inflection of his voice. She rose, tottering on weak knees. "'Where are you going?' asked Henry in a strange, breathless voice. Mrs. Brigham said something incoherent about some sewing which she had to do, some black for the funeral, and was out of the room. She went up to the front chamber which she occupied. Caroline was there. She went close to her and took her hands, and the two sisters looked at each other. "'Don't speak, don't. I won't have it,' said Caroline, finally in an awful whisper." I won't, replied Emma. That afternoon the three sisters were in the study, the large front room on the ground floor across the hall from the south parlor, when the dusk deepened. Mrs. Brigham was hemming some black material. She sat close to the west window for the waning light. At last she laid her work on her lap. It's no use. I cannot see to sew another stitch until we have a light, said she. Caroline, who was writing some letters at the table, turned to Rebecca in her usual place on the sofa. "'Rebecca, you had better get a lamb,' she said. Rebecca started up. Even in the dusk her face showed her agitation. "'It doesn't seem to me that we need a lamb quite yet,' 
she said in a piteous, pleading voice like a child's. Yes, we do, returned Mrs. Brigham peremptorily. We must have a light. I must finish this tonight, or I can't go to the funeral, and I can't see to sew another stitch. Caroline can see to write letters, and she is farther from the window than you are, said Rebecca. Are you trying to save kerosene, or are you lazy, Rebecca Glynn, cried Mrs. Brigham. I can go and get the light myself, but I have this work all in my lap. Caroline's pen stopped scratching. Rebecca, we must have the light, said she. Have we better have it in here, asked Rebecca weakly. Of course, why not, cried Caroline sternly. I am sure I don't want to take my sewing into the other room, when it is all cleaned up for tomorrow, said Mrs. Brigham. Why, I never heard such a to-do about lighting a lamp. Rebecca rose and left the room. Presently she entered with a lamp, a large one with a white porcelain shade. She set it on a table, an old-fashioned card table, which was placed against the opposite wall from the window. That wall was clear of bookcases and books, which were only on three sides of the room. That opposite wall was taken up with three doors, the one small space being occupied by the table. Above the table, on the old-fashioned paper of a white satin gloss, traversed by an indeterminate green scroll, hung quite high a small gilt and black-framed ivory miniature, taken in her girlhood of the mother of the family. When the lamp was set on the table beneath it, the tiny pretty face painted on the ivory seemed to gleam out with a look of intelligence. "'What have you put that lamp over there for?' asked Mrs. Brigham, with more of impatience than her voice usually revealed. "'Why didn't you set it in the hall and have done with it? Neither Caroline nor I can see if it is on that table.' "'I thought perhaps you would move,' replied Rebecca hoarsely. If I do move, we can't both sit at that table. Caroline has her paper all spread around. Why don't you set the lamp on the study table in the middle of the room? Then we can both see. Rebecca hesitated. Her face was very pale. She looked with an appeal that was fairly agonizing at her sister Caroline. Why don't you put that lamp on this table, as she says, asked Caroline almost fiercely. Why do you act so, Rebecca? I should think you would ask her that, said Mrs. Brigham. She doesn't act like herself at all. Rebecca took the lamp and set it on the table in the middle of the room without another word. Then she turned her back upon it quickly and seated herself on the sofa and placed her hand over her eyes as to shade them and remain so. Does the light hurt your eyes and is that the reason why you didn't want the lamp? asked Mrs. Brigham kindly. I always like to sit in the dark, replied Rebecca chokingly. Then she snatched her handkerchief hastily from her pocket and began to weep. Caroline continued to write, Mrs. Brigham to sue. End of section 3 Recording by Ernst Schnell